goodness. <laughs> that was hearty, and you didn't even know that I have a Swedish grandmother. So you see, I'm not really Irish at all, although I worked for Paul Swenson, Kay's father, and so it helped uh, if you had a little bit of, of uh, Scandinavian in you somewhere along the line. Well, <clears throat> this isn't very educational, so I'll start out by telling you about the day that Zsa, Zsa Gabor oozed off a plane out at the airport, completely swathed in tourmaline mink, that's the blonde kind, and she had on a brown dress that looked sort of ordinary to me until I discovered that it had a Paris label in it. Uh, she was wearing some pearls that hit her at about the kneecap, and she had some earrings on that I gathered were diamonds, and she assured me that I was correct. And uh, when I stood there to greet her, she looked and said, Oh, a woman. I'm so rarely met by women. Well she decided that she was going to have to make do uh, as long as I was standing there with this giddy smile on my face and so she invited me to supper and I accepted why not I wasn't going to get this chance too often and we climbed into a cab and started downtown and uh, I think then she decided the thing to do was to be very very folksy indeed and so she began talking about the remarkable things American women do and how they manage families and careers and how they uh, always seem to look right and she so admired the career girls and not only did Zsa, Zsa admire them but so did her mama Jolie and her sisters a uh, Ava and Magda and she said the reason that they felt that career women were so admirable was because they too were simple working girls. Well I looked at the pearls <laughs> and at the diamonds and at the tourmaline mink and the Paris gown, and I thought somewhere along the line I'd gotten into the wrong kind of work. But at any rate, uh, this is only to begin to point out that you probably won't get rich in the newspaper business. Uh, you can in some of the uh, fields on the periphery, but nevertheless, it's a great deal of fun. You have lots of excitement. Uh, for example, uh, only a month ago, I got to go out to the home of some Minnesotans who keep a mountain lion. <laughs> Exciting, you bet. <laughs> they not only keep it, they let it come into the family room. And the thing thinks it's a member of the family. And so it chews on gloves with the hands not in them, hopefully. Uh, I should also recall that not always is it a famous person who gives you a good story. For example, I'll never forget the Coon Rapids housewife who went out one day to buy an ironing board cover. She was driving down the road and saw a young man she recognized as the friend of the boy next door, so she stopped, picked him up, got him into the car and realized that this was not the boy she thought it was, and she was quite nervous about it, of course, because just that very day had been the news that three young desperados who had killed a policeman, injured another one, were on the loose, and the police were having a manhunt. So the lady managed to make an excuse and get rid of the young man, and then she made quick tracks in for the police chief and poured out to him uh, her story, and he said, get in, and she kept talking, and just at that second, over his radio came the news that indeed they were in the neighborhood, everybody was on the alert, the police were closing in. Well. For the next four and a half to five hours, our housewife spent her time mostly crouching beneath the dashboard in the car of the chief of police, learning how to load shotguns and rifles, something she'd never done before. And, <clears throat> of course, this is a terrifying thing when you think about it, but let's face it, she'd only been on her way to buy an ironing board cover, and it is a lot more exciting in a police chase, even if it is scary. So she stuck with it because she had no choice and was in at the very, uh, oh, I don't know if you can call it exciting, but sort of terrifying end when they did indeed capture them. And so it was late when she got home, long toward 8, 8.30, 9 o'clock, way past dinner time, and sitting in the living room were her husband and her three children, two of them teenagers, and of course here she was. Golly, nothing ever happened to her, but today something did. And so she began to just prattle about this incredible five hours she just spent. And when she had finished, completely breathless, her husband looked at her and said, oh, for heaven's sake, Charlotte, let's eat. So you see, <laughs> you can't impress. I think uh, probably uh, one of the things I felt when I interviewed Madame New was that uh, she had taken 
this idea of women's suffrage too far. <laughs> it just uh, doesn't really apply, you know. Um, we are emancipated, but uh, you should keep your mouths shut. Uh, men always bristle, you know. Uh, she was beautiful, but she kept saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. And uh, I'll always remember sitting there with this uh, girl reporter from the Chicago paper. Uh, we were the only two that got in to have really a private interview with Madame New. She was this delicate, you know, China doll type that you couldn't believe, you know, was sort of uh, this dragon lady uh, type, and you know, behind this facade. And uh, she sat there and she said, uh, oh, you American women. She says, you think you have so much. And I, I just gulped. I thought, well, I didn't have much. I'll wait and see what she's going to say. And she said, yes. Yeah. She said, you're not emancipated. She said, you don't run the world. And I said, oh, no, that's true. We don't. <laughs> and, and she said, do you know, she said, what I've done for my women, and so we said no, and she said, I have gone and passed a law in Parliament and that women uh, can have access to their husband's banking accounts. And I said, oh, really? I said, isn't that fascinating? I said, they haven't passed a law over here, but every woman I know has her hands on her husband's money. <laughs> well, at any rate, this was her problem. She talked too much. Because you see, one of the things you have to do, I guess, all your lives, and this is addressed to the ladies, obviously, is to get along with men. In the newspaper business, they are your colleagues as well as your competitors. And so you learn the lesson early. Well, how do you do it? I've asked from time to time various and sundry women that I've interviewed just how they do get along with men. And so here are some answers. Joan Fontaine, the very lovely blonde film actress, says, don't wear a hat. Men don't like hats. Joyce Brothers, the lady psychologist who has an answer for everything, says, do your living room in orange and pink. It will give him a lift. When he comes in the house, he'll be so revved up, he'll take you out to dinner. My theory is he won't be able to stay in the orange and pink, and he'll just want to get out of the house. <laughs> Carol Channing, who's so delightful, says, wear hats. She says, it covers up all your worst faults. And what are your worst faults? Hair curlers, of course. She goes around with her hair and curlers constantly hidden under huge hats or great big wigs because her husband, a Minneapolitan, is just like most men, can't stand hair curlers. As for Mrs. Barry Goldwater, a woman who's personality was hard to probe into because she really did prefer to remain in the background. And nevertheless, she did go with him when he went campaigning, and she could say honestly that in 40 years of marriage, she'd never kept him waiting. Incredible indeed. She was always ready before he was. As for Lady Bird Johnson, I think probably one of the uh, truly outstanding first lady. She's going to be, I think, a whirlwind. Uh, she has all of the attributes, personality, brains, you know, this kind of get up and, and go kind of personality that apparently is bred in Texas. And uh, she said, very frankly, she said, well, she said, I don't think women, she said, to please men should ever wear pants or slacks except down on the ranch. And that's when Lyndon approves and she can wear them there and so can the girls, but not around walking up and down the streets, although the Minneapolis Star poll only last week, you noticed that quite a few men didn't mind if women wore slacks downtown to shop, but most women minded. And so what are you going to do? I think you have to be a good sport. Pearl Mesta is. Mrs. Mesta, who became famous as the hostess with the mostest in the Truman administration, was sent by Harry Truman to Luxembourg, uh, kind of on a Oh, I don't know, probably a little bit of patronage, but she turned out to be a very good minister from the United States and then was out in the Kennedy administration, but is back in again in the Johnson administration. Well, Pearl is probably one of the great, delightful characters of all time. I first met her at a diplomatic reception for Princess Astrid of Norway and Prince Bertel of Sweden at the Norwegian Embassy in Washington. This was one of those parties where you get the invitation that says, arrive at 10.05 p.m. decorations. This meant all the men in the crowd got to wear their medals, and apparently you don't get to wear them too often. And so they all put them on, actually clanked upstairs, wait, waited down on the left side, with all these things hanging here on their tail Coats. And uh, then the women were required to wear long gowns. There was a major domo. He sang out your name. You went through the line. You shook hands with the royalty and with Chief Justice Warren and Mrs. Warren and with Vice President Mrs. Nixon. This was uh, during the Eisenhower administration. We'd been at the White House in the afternoon. And then I just sort of stood back and watched all these glittering types from the diplomatic corps walk through. And another Minnesotan was standing with me. And suddenly I noticed across the room a a group having a great time, and suddenly the crowd parted, and here was this little woman. Well, she had lots of curly hair and a diamond butterfly in it, 
She was wearing a champagne satin gown re-embroidered in silver. She was wearing a five-strand diamond necklace, one of those things called a waterfall with a great, great big one right here in the middle. She had on some diamond bracelets. Somebody had sent her a white orchid. Uh, she put that on. And then, you see, because Pearl had really been a hit in Luxembourg, the Grand Duchess had decorated her. Not too many women have these decorations, but Pearl had one, and you can't wear them unless the invitation says you can, so by gosh, she was going to do it, and she did. Unfortunately, from Luxembourg, you get a ribbon that is a bilious yellow and a ghastly purple, and it's quite wide, and it's striped, and she had managed to tack that across her bosom in between the diamonds and the orchid. And then, you see, <clears throat> when you get one of the ribbons, you also get one of those pointed star pins. Not little, one of those great big ones. And you have to tack that on, too. So she had that on, too. Anyway, she took one look at my friend, came down toward us. I was introduced. She envelops you with her smile. You can see why she does like to meet people. Then she turned to him, and she said, Oh, I'm so thrilled tonight. I never get to wear my decorations, and tonight I got to. How does it look? He looked at her for one long, awful moment and finally said, Pearl, you look just great, as if you'd won first prize at the Minnesota State Fair. <laughs> well... I was shocked, but Pearl apparently wasn't, and I think she would have slapped her knee if she could have gotten to it through all the petticoats. <laughs> Mary Martin just says, be different, and she is. Mary Martin is a perfectly charming individual who likes to travel in ski suits. When I met her, I said, do you ski? She said, no, I just like to travel in ski suits. It's fair enough. As for Rosalind Russell, she says, don't sit down. I said, what do you mean, don't sit down? She said, well, after you've been to a rich uh, dinner with lots of calories. She said, <clears throat> keep up on your feet for 20 minutes. Lean against the mantle if you don't have too much strength, but don't sit down and you'll stay slim. She said, I just don't believe in all this rolling around on the floor and doing exercises. She said, you do have to stay slim. Men prefer it, but she said, you can do it your way. So this is her way. As for Mrs. Julio de Diego, well, she seemed to believe that the thing to do was to cater to him. At the time I met her, she was married to Julio, who is an artist, a good one, a professor. Uh, he wore his hair long in those days, long before the Beatles had ever thought of it. And he wore one gold earring, a la Mr. Clean, long before Mr. Clean had ever thought of it. He was wearing a blue shirt and a red cummerbund and blue slacks and thong sandals, you know. And uh, they were traveling in a trailer, which Julio had done. And uh, Mrs. De Diego was absolutely enchanted by the fact that he had hooked the rug and block printed the Davenport cover and woven the curtains and, and pounded out the lamp bases and made the lampshades out of parchment and then hanging from the low ceiling he'd made all sorts of stunning uh, mobiles that kind of got you right between the eyes when you walked in the door. And uh, so she wanted to talk about this and I wasn't too interested because Mrs. Julio de Diego was, in her day, very famous as Gypsy Rose Lee, the queen of the striptease. She actually was started in this by a man named Mike Todd, who was born in Bloomington and spent a lot of time selling newspapers down on the corner of Grant Street and Nicollet, Minneapolis, before he went on to greater fame as a movie producer. So I asked Mrs. de Diego, quite frankly, I said, how do you find all these beautiful, long-stemmed American beauties that you were so famous for finding? And she said, oh... I just look around me. She said, they're, they're really not much. I said, oh, really? She said, oh, no. She said, any girl five foot six or over is all right. She said, or even she could be shorter. We'll put high heels on her. And I said, oh, really? And she said, yes. She said, and we put makeup on her face, and that helps. And I said, yes. And she said, and wigs. I said, yes, that, that's true. And she said, and then, of course, she said, honey. She said, they're all padded. And I said, oh, really? She said, oh, yes, I'm the only one, she said, that isn't. And I said, oh, and she said, oh, she says, we take anybody at all, she said, any real dog, and pad them up and fix them up, and they just become beautiful. I said, isn't that just fascinating? She said, yes. <laughs> she said, uh, with a pad here and there, you wouldn't be half bad. How would you like to join the show? Well, <laughs> I just didn't know what to say, <clears throat> and I haven't said anything yet. I'm still thinking it over. I think in the newspaper business, you've got to be hip, if that's the word, aware, curious, 
You've got to be courteous, too, and nosy, but nice about it, boned up and well-read. I don't think you can ever be blasé, and I think you have to be ready for almost anything. So when you are told you have to go interview Dr. Ralph Bunch, the Nobel Prize winner, you go and you discover that you're going to yell the questions at him across half a lake because he's vacationing in Detroit Lakes. But he's a dear, dear man, nevertheless. And uh, yet you have to be kind of, you know, up. So you go and bone up. It's like in college. You go in the library and sort of read uh, like crazy. Or, uh, for example, uh, when you go and you're fortunate enough to get an opportunity to have an audience with the late Pope Pius, you go and look and see what happens. And you're kind of startled until you find out. And I had asked some questions. The first time I went, and I am a Protestant, uh, I stood there with about 40 other people, including about 30 men from the United States Navy. And when the Pope walked into the room in the Vatican Palace, the chief petty officer said, all right, men, let's give three cheers for the Pope. Hip, hip. And they all went hooray. And I thought, oh, you know, good grief. And I said, this is what you read about. You know, Americans don't know how to conduct themselves properly overseas. Well, it turned out on asking questions that this was something that had become a tradition with pious and that the Navy, our Navy, has always given him three cheers when they've gone to visit and he has looked forward to it and had expected it and was delighted by it. And so you see, you never know. Uh, when you cover royalty, you have to mind your manners or try to mind your manners. And of course, uh, my latest faux pas was on meeting Prince Harold. I stuck out my hand, <laughs> well, and it had a dirty pigskin glove on it, but he, being a gentleman, took it. Uh, also, you know, what do you say when you're sitting toe-to-toe -to -toe on a boat across Lake Minnetonka with Prince Harold. Well, fortunately, he was younger than I enough so that I wasn't going to worry about that, even though there was an October moon out, and he was interested in Indians. Well, I sort of searched back to third grade <laughs> when we'd spent a lot of time down there in Iowa around Tama looking at the Meskwaki tribe, and I just <laughs> poured this all out, and apparently it served as long as we were on water, and, you know, I managed to get out without embarrassing myself too much. Uh, with Queen Elizabeth, of course, you do not get too much of an opportunity to speak to her. She has to speak first. Uh, the British family seems to be much more formalized than the Scandinavian royalty I've met. And um, so you sort of stay out of her way and, and kind of hang on the edges. And in New York and in Chicago, the big towns where there's lots of press on hand, you really just see her. You don't even get close. You see her driving up uh, Fifth Avenue and in the car waving wearing the bronze velveteen coat with the little uh, ermine lapels and the dukes in the car behind and there's the leather lung man who yells Hawaii you dookie welcome to New York and he looks happy and it's like that and in Chicago it's the same thing with Mayor Daly sort of you know strutting around and the Queen and you just you don't even get close so I was delighted to go to courteous Canada where in the small towns of Port Arthur and Fort William you really had a chance uh, this was fun. There were only five reporters there. Uh, the towns aren't too big. Uh, they stepped off of the uh, yacht onto the shore, out of the tender, and we had to back out of their way. Here was the queen, very small, very diminutive, great complexion, beautiful blue eyes, wearing yellow tweed, a yellow turban, a pretty silk dress, and he isn't that tall. You see, she's so short. He's probably five, eight and a half, five, nine. They keep saying six feet. Couldn't be. Uh, and he was wearing that old gray suit of his that he seems to adore with a crushed hat, you know, behind his and brown suede shoes. And uh, so we walked uh, out to the uh, stadium where the children of the town were going to sing God Save the Queen, where she met all the dignitaries. And as I say, we kept backing out of her way. And finally, the Duke stopped and chatted just about the weather. It looked like it was going to rain. Very pleasant about the whole thing. And a couple of seconds later, another English type came over in gray flannels and said, Jadu. And I said, Jadu. And he said, where are you from? And I said, Minneapolis. And he said, oh, the States. And I explained this was just down the road a piece. And he said, uh, <laughs> goodness, he said, would you mind awfully sending us some cuttings of this? And I said, no. And the photographer would have been happy. And so that was that. And it started to rain. Well, the thing that's remarkable, I guess, about Elizabeth, or I suppose anyone schooled in royalty, is that they don't let anything bother them of this type, where we all run and, you know, get all upset. No, she got in the car. Philip held a black umbrella over this over her in this open car. Obviously she was wet. She got to the hotel for the luncheon, patted her hair like standing in the lobby like this. Her uh, The lady with her handed her a fresh pair of white gloves and she walked right into that 
dining room where a hundred people, including myself, and I was really bedraggled by that time, sat there watching them eat. I'd never thought about this before. When you're royal, people sit and watch every morsel you put into your mouths. And they, I mean, it was just unbelievable. Everybody was there like this. And <laughs> Philip was sitting there eating and talking. You see, you learn how to do this. You're taught not to talk with food in your mouths, but when you're royal, you've got to learn. Otherwise, you're never going to get through a meal. And as I say, they, they apparently just learned how to live with this. And everybody's sort of, you know, like this, not paying any attention at all. So this was fascinating. We sent the cuttings. And two weeks later, came a letter back saying, uh, dear Miss Flanagan, thank you so very much for the cuttings. We all enjoyed them very much indeed. It was signed by Sir Edward Ford, and of course to this day we'll, we don't know whether it was we referred to the upstairs maid, the downstairs maid, and the footman, or whether the queen and the prince actually did read them. At any rate, it was great fun. And I can't help but contrast these warm welcomes that she received in Chicago and New York and in Canada with the one that the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, the Duke, her uncle, received on a very sleety Easter Sunday in St. Paul. And he and his Wife came through town on a train, and I was sent over to meet him with a photographer. There wasn't anybody else there. Wretched day. And uh, we stood on the platform. Pretty soon the door opened. Out came the Duke. He was looking very blonde and very tan and blue-eyed, a little bit tired. They'd been in Florida doing nothing. We're going to Canada to do nothing more. And he was wearing a long yellow shaggy top coat and a pair of yellow and black checkered tweed trousers. And he said, how do you do? And that was it. And out she came. And she's a best-dressed woman wearing a simple navy blue jersey dress, a not-so-simple little sable jacket. She, too, is much prettier than her pictures. And she looked at me. I looked awful, as usual. And she said, my, what a dreadful day. And I said, yes, it was. And she said, <clears throat> she was undercover. I was out. In it. And uh, she said, Easter Sunday, too. And I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, uh, I suppose Minnesota women couldn't wear their Easter bonnets to church today, could they? And I said, oh, yes. I mean, Minnesota women are those hardy, pioneering types. Uh, <clears throat> whose Scandinavian and German ancestors did it before them, and they wouldn't go to church on Easter Sunday without putting on a new hat or something like that. Remarkable, said the Duchess, and turning to the Duke, who was right at her elbow, she said, did you hear that, dear? Isn't that remarkable? And he said, remarkable. Well, <laughs> it was obvious at this point that I had made their day. It had been just canasta all the way up until that point, and... Uh, I really kind of didn't know what else to say. How could I top it, you know? And so uh, I said a few other things, I guess, and she turned anyway and went in. And as he turned to go, a railroad worker down on the tracks, just to be funny, I guess, yelled, Cheerio, Dookie, come back again, something like that. And he turned, and he looked so kind of pleased and smiled a little bit. He is a shy man, I think, and, and he kind of waved like this. And he said, oh, thank you very much, and cheerio. And then as he turned to go back into the railroad car, he took one long last look at wretched old me, and he said, remarkable. And that's the last ever saw. <laughs> well, <clears throat> you get along in English, but it certainly would help if you can speak two or three or four languages in newspapering, uh, or, and including, the, the language of the person you're interviewing, whether it's a prime minister or an artist or a writer or a fashion creator or a kook or Jimmy Durante. Durante speaks Durante ease. It's something that was bred in the Lower East Side of New York and honed in Coney Island. You've got to listen to understand Durante. And so the other day, when I was attempting to put this down, spell it, it was kind of difficult because his great line the other day, after having sipped a bit of Minnesota milk, he's a great milk drinker, by the way, he raised that one eyebrow, he sort of cocked his head, you know, with this incredible nose, and he looked kind of fey and said, I'd like to be introduced to the cow, which only he can say, and it sounds good. <laughs> So this is what you do in newspaper. You can specialize. You can be an education writer, a social welfare writer, or you can specialize, as I have, mostly in crowds. I have covered queens and parades and state fairs and all sorts of things, but it's been good because I've been to Europe about eight times. I've been to Central America and the Caribbean. I've gone to the Rose Bowl. I went to the late Mike Todd's famous party, and or infamous party, I guess, in Madison Square Garden. I've been to the Academy Awards and the Anonymous. I've been down to cover the baseball opening of the season and also a championship prize fight. 
um, it's sort of fun, you know. Uh, the inaugural last year was a whole new experience. She worked hard, but it was incredible to sit there on Capitol Hill under a blue sky and a brisk wind, and the flag is there, and I'm I really do get emotional when I see it. You know, you, you think it's trite and it's a cliche, uh, all the postcards, all the things, but there it is, and it looks beautiful against the blue sky and the white Capitol dome. And suddenly, too, you recognize a person you've known for a long, long time named Hubert H. Humphrey sitting up there. And so you sit down and you, you wait, and the band is playing, and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir is singing, and you look around you, and there's Betty Furness of refrigerator fame dressed up uh, for this uh, event. Apparently, Betty wasn't quite sure. Uh, she showed up in an orange plush jumpsuit, a lynx fur coat, brown crocodile high heel boots, and lots of gold jewelry. Well, I wasn't taking any chances. I put on my hat with the ear laps and my leotards and my boots, because it was cold out there. <clears throat> and, um, and so I was sitting there, and this couple came over toward me, and I was looking around at all the people, and... Um, this uh, fellow came over to me, and he said, uh, excuse me. Oh, and we wore tags saying where we were from. He said, uh, excuse me. He said, uh, are you wearing long underwear? Well, that was an interesting opening gambit. And I <laughs> thought I should at least answer him, and I said, no, I'm not. He said, oh, he said, well, excuse me. He said, I'm Philip Hamburger from the New Yorker magazine, and we are, and this is Mrs. Hamburger. Well, this is the man who writes these perfectly superb articles entitled The Gazetteer about various and sundry towns that he goes to. They were a delightful couple. They sat down with me. They were freezing to death. It was about 029 with a good stiff wind blowing, but, you know, cold, but still not what we're used to here. And uh, so we watched it together. And uh, above us in a glassed-in booth sat Huntley and Brinkley in their gray flannel suits looking stunning. And uh, he looked up <clears throat> at one point, Mr. Hamburger, and he said, oh, there they are, he said, the electronic marvels, he said, H and B soaking their feet in hot consomme, no doubt, which I thought was a perfectly lovely line. I think the thing you have to do uh, in uh, an event of this type is just sort of make some friends and hope they'll help you out. And so in this case, Humphrey was ours, because that night in the incredible crush of the ball, we stood for two hours, Earl Seibert and myself, dressed up to the teeth, we had to be to get in, uh, with about 3,000 people crushing behind us, we were right up against the red ropes. The Secret Service men had designated a small space on the floor where the presidential party could dance. And so we were there. We stood waiting. And when they finally came, uh, the president led Mrs. Eugenie Anderson down the floor for the first dance. And uh, uh, Mr. Humphrey took Mrs. Humphrey. And then uh, Lucy was in pink. And she was not with Pat then. She had somebody else in tow at the time. And then there was Linda with somebody else. And so this was the group. Well. You see, we've all known Humphrey for quite a long time, and uh, he knew that we had to get a story. So after he started dancing with other women, he danced by and he'd say, Barbara, this is Ms. so-and-so and so-and-so, her husband is such-and-such -such at the White House, and I'd be standing there writing down, and he'd dance off. And he'd dance back this way, and he said, the president's dancing with so-and-so and so-and-so, and I'd say, thank you, Mr. Vice President. And it was this way. I mean, I thought of it. We just about died afterwards, but I mean, thank goodness. You know, he remembered that we were trying to do our job. So uh, this helps. Uh, make some friends, and once in a while, too, one of them might invite you to a party for Ingrid Bergman. That happened to me in Hollywood, and this was an incredible thing. Or you could go to a ball at the Staatshuset in Stockholm for all the Lucias, or to a tea in, of all places, Jane Mansfield's pink bedroom with the pink heart-shaped mantelpiece. Uh, I, might, <coughs> I might add, Jane in those days <coughs> was really just another housewife. She used to collect green stamps and use them to buy bassinets, and then she'd spend $200 on blue net to cover it. Uh, there is one small problem in the newspaper, and you do have to know how to write and spell and punctuate and be accurate, accurate and imaginative all at once. Uh, you do this on your own. Nobody really helps. An editor might help you become imaginative, but those other skills you've got to sort of know. So this means you take any course you could put your hands on, because the more you know, the better. You sort of go through life with this great smattering of knowledge, and perhaps you'll end up specializing in one thing, but nevertheless, it's good to know a lot. Well, the chances for advancement for a woman in newspapering are, you know, who knows? You'll probably never be managing editor, and you'll probably never write major league sports, because all of the major league sports organizations have rules saying that women aren't allowed in the press boxes. Well, ladies, I've been in them, and just to look, and there's really nothing there, you know. So don't worry about that. Uh, so what you do is you try to aim for something else that will be more fun, let the fellows write the sports. You start out uh, advancing, say, from Jim Arness, 
who is very tall and very attractive. Of course, our favorite Matt Dillon on Gunsmoke, born in Minneapolis, went to Washburn High. You interview him, have lunch with him, talk about the good old days back in Minneapolis. And then you advance to Rock Hudson, who turned out to be kind of a dullard. Uh, he's tall and dark and handsome, but he just discussed his boat. Uh, he was really, uh, I mean, pleasant enough, but you know, not really too terribly zingy. Of course, I met him for all those Doris Day movies, so maybe he's changed. Uh, then, of course, you advanced to Marlon Brando, who turned out to be one of the pleasantest people I've ever met in my life. We spent about uh, half a, a day together, lunching on a set, talking, drinking Dad's root beer, his favorite. Uh, Brando's had so many bad uh, stories written about him. Uh, he hates the Hollywood press. I have no idea why he consented to see me, but he did. And uh, I must say that not only is he brilliant, bright, clever, funny, but he's very modest, and so you talk about anything but Brando, and your conversation will range across, you know, the whole scope. It's great fun, and uh, everybody who works with him and for him has this high regard for Brando as a perfectionist and as for a man with great patience and a good sense of humor about himself. And they tell the story about how he did spend the day or the day before I was there trying to teach an old dog some new tricks. The dog wouldn't learn. And finally, as Brando walked away, having given up <clears throat> after several hours, somebody said, gee, that's too bad, Marlon. What kind of a dog is that? And he kept walking. You could almost see him, hands in his pockets, his head down, and he mumbled, recalcitrant. Uh, this is, as I say, Brando, and I liked him. Well, you advanced then to Cary Grant, and <laughs> Cary Grant, ladies and gentlemen, is 65. And yet, he stands there, sort of like this monument, you know, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, let's carve his face out there in the Black Hills. Uh, this is, you know, a face that you've sort of grown up with. He has spanned three generations. And he stands there and completely bowls you over. And so, therefore, I can tell you nothing about the interview. I couldn't even ask a question. I just stood there and looked. There he was, 3D and in color. Cary Grant, who has gone from the 1930s to the 1960s in movies, and he still looks just great. He's 65. Isn't that just incredible? Well... So there you are. Uh, you might prefer talking to Steve Allen or Johnny Carson or Bob Hope. All are delightful, great fun. Or Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson. Talk to them. They're all very pleasant in different ways. Or you might want to talk to Ricky Nelson or the Dave Clark Five. I avoided the Beatles. I didn't talk to them. But you do have to be prepared for just about anything, such as lunch with the daughter of one of the world's richest women, Dina Merrill, the actress whose mother is Mrs. Marjorie Post Merriweather May. I went to lunch with her, and guess what? Dina showed up wearing a dress. Well, you can buy it on Nicollet Avenue in the budget department, and guess what? I had on the same dress. Well, turned out <clears throat> we were... Uh, we had a charming time, and I must say, you know, money must not be everything. At any rate, she was pleasant indeed. Or you get a theater invitation from Marlene Dahl, the actress who was born in Minneapolis. She sort of drifted into the Guthrie in a brown chiffon, and I sort of trailed along in her wake. And uh, that's kind of fun. Or you go down and cover baseball in Florida, and this is giddy. Or go to the championship fight in Miami, and you see all these people. This was the Patterson Johansson fight several years ago. Or you have lunch with the Minnesota Vikings, and you know, they're pretty funny, all in all, and uh, kind of pleasant to talk to. You can also have doors slammed in your face, unless you're careful and uh, well the other thing that you have to sort of do and be careful about excuse me I've got to get something I forgot is you've got to um, try not to uh, talk too much I uh, went to a um, oh another diplomatic thing in Stockholm at uh, <clears throat> which we sat at tables it was a party for the Mexican uh, diplomatic corps, and a young man came around to ask me to dance. He was blonde, he was wearing a tux, and he was smoking Chesterfields, and I accepted. We got up on the floor, <laughs> and turned out he was from the Soviet Union. He was in the Soviet embassy in Stockholm. His name was Georgi, and he was from Kiev. And uh, this, as I said, was for the Mexicans, so uh, they were playing a lot of rumbas and things like that, but Georgi didn't like those capitalistic dances, so he waltzed for everything. And... Uh, <laughs> This made it kind of interesting in itself, you know, and we, so we waltzed through La Cucaracha, and, and um, we were talking, and, and we talked about a lot of things, you know, and, and uh, he didn't know who I was. We were just chatting and dancing, and then they went in somehow, and we were still waltzing, and finally, somewhere along the third dance of the set, 
uh, Georgi said, uh, and what in the world do you do coming way over here from America? What is your work? And I said, oh, I said, I'm a newspaper reporter. And Georgi sort of looked stricken, and he didn't say anything more, and we finished out the waltz, and we walked back to the table, and of course they've been trained in manners if they're in the diplomatic corps, and so he bowed and clicked his heels and said, I enjoyed the dessert very much, did you not? And I said yes, and he said goodbye, and completely disappeared. And so I thought perhaps I shouldn't have told him because it sort of ruined his evening. So the thing is, you shouldn't talk too much. If I'd kept my mouth shut, maybe I'd, you know or learn some kind of a state secret. I doubt it, though, because I just can't keep my mouth shut. Uh, there's one last idea, and that is never go anywhere, ladies, uh, without carrying smelling salts. You men might try it, too. Uh, the reason I say this is that my grandmother always carried smelling salts, and so I have. Well, what do you know? In Paris, Pearl Mesta felt faint. I whipped them out. In Minneapolis last year, George Grizzard almost fainted on a platform. I whipped them out. And then, uh, once in a while, you know, a, a photographer gets kind of loaded down and, and kind of, you know, blurry-eyed, and I just whip them out. And so, carry smelling salts. It's a great little picker-upper. Now then, anybody here feel faint after this? I've got them with me. Thank you. You've been very nice.